few of the environmental arguments. The Earth is surrounded by the Van Allen radiation belts. Passage through them would have killed the astronauts from the radiation present. If radiologists have to leave the room or wear lead aprons every time they take an X-ray, then how is it that the Apollo spacecraft didn't have the equivalent protection in proportion to the much higher radiation of the Van Allen radiation belts? If that wasn't bad enough, outside the protection of the Van Allen belts, the astronauts would be at the mercy of solar flares. Solar flares are unpredictable, except for the fact that they occur more frequently, roughly every 11 years, with one such peak occurring right during the middle of the Apollo missions. One such flare occurred between Apollo, the Apollo 16 and Apollo 17 missions, and would have been sufficient to kill the astronauts had they been on or near the moon. Six feet of lead would have been needed to protect the astronauts. Then there's the lunar module's descent engine, which created 10,000 pounds of thrust. It should have blown a huge crater underneath it as it landed on the moon, yet photos reveal no such crater. And while sitting on the surface of the moon, the lunar module would have been heated to 120 degrees. There's no way this heat could have been rejected from the spacecraft, and the result would have been cooked electronics. As the astronauts walked on the surface of the moon, they supposedly created sharp footprints on the surface, even though the surface is supposed to be bone dry. Yet if you walk on the beach, the only time you create sharp footprints is when the sand is wet. <coughs> and if the astronauts were really on the moon, the one-sixth gravity there would allow them to leap up three or four metres off the ground. Yet there's no sign they ever did that. Now we turn to the photographic evidence. The Apollo astronauts took lots of photos. So many, in fact, that one hoax believer has calculated that the astronauts took roughly one photograph every 50 seconds that they, that they were on their moonwalks when they weren't setting up experiments. This would hardly leave time for them to do anything else. Yet the photographs and the video footage also appear to contain anomalies which suggest they weren't taken on the moon. The photos show no signs of stars. This is said to be because it would have been impossible for NASA to accurately recreate the star field correctly and astronomers would have blown a whistle. Some photos show shadows going in all sorts of different directions and others show astronauts at the same height with shadows at different lengths. These are indications that spotlights were used as we know that the shadows caused by the sun run parallel and people at the same height cast shadows at the same length. Photographs with, the, uh, with different foregrounds show identical backgrounds. This is an indication that NASA must have been using a movie set. And the film and the cameras wouldn't have survived the massive temperature changes on the moon between being in direct sunlight or in the shade. On top of that, the film would have been followed by radiation. A little technical one here. The Apollo cameras were fitted with what's called Reso plates, which put 25 very thin crosses on each photo, called reticles. The famous man in the moon photo shows the main reticle in the middle of one of Buzz Aldrin's legs, which doesn't make sense if the camera is attached to Neil Armstrong's chest. Because it's clear the camera was at least 60 centimetres higher than Buzz Aldrin's chest, where, his camera, where the camera would have been on his chest, there's no way Armstrong could have taken the photo, as he isn't 60 centimetres <coughs> taller than, the, than Buzz Aldrin. How did the astronauts take so many good photos when they didn't have a range finder? <coughs> and as far as uh, TV transmission is concerned, a TV transmission from Apollo 11, when it was supposedly halfway to the moon, shows blue sky outside the window, meaning that must have been in Earth orbit at the time. And a woman in Perth who was watching the Apollo 11 moonwalk live in the evening saw a Coke bottle get kicked across the screen. <laughs> But when the footage was replayed the following day, the coke bottle had gone. <laughs> the woman wrote to the West Australian newspaper about this, as did others, and several articles about it appeared in the newspaper. Um, there's other evidence that supports the notion that moon ladies were faked, or that would be true if they were faked. For example, with the rocks. Why did the famous German-American rocket engineer Werner von Braun go to Antarctica in 1968? Was it to collect lunar meteorites to pass off as moon rocks? Moon rocks could also be faked by uh, putting earth rocks in a radiation oven. Anyway, geologists wouldn't know what a moon rock looked like because they'd never seen one before. And even if they did have their suspicions, they'd know better than to risk their careers by blowing a whistle. 
And even if they were genuine moon rocks, they could have been retrieved by unmanned sample retrieval missions, as the Soviets did. Then there's the problem of astronauts speaking out, or not, as the case may be. Gus Grissom, the commander of Apollo 1, hung a lemon on the command module to show how useless he thought it was. A couple of weeks later, he was killed in a fire near the command module, along with his crewmates. Apollo 15 astronaut Jim Irwin was going to spill the beans on the Apollo moon hoax, but died of a heart attack before he could say anything publicly. In fact, several other, several other astronauts died violent deaths in the period leading up to Apollo, leading to speculation that they were killed to keep them silent. An engineer at the company which was building the command module gave evidence for the official inquiry into the Apollo 1 accident that the spacecraft was dangerous and that unsafe shortcuts were being made in its construction. Only weeks after giving evidence, he and his family were killed in an accident at a level crossing. <coughs> so, if it was impossible for Americans to walk on the moon, why was it necessary to fake the landings? Why couldn't they just say it was impossible? Well, the two main arguments offered are that NASA, and as an organ of the US government, felt obliged to meet the challenge of the assassinated President Kennedy. On top of that, faking the moon landings gave the USA the appearance of technological superiority over the USSR in the larger context of the Cold War. In any case, if it was possible for humans to walk on the moon, the Soviets would have done it. They had a moon landing program too, but they dropped it. This suggests that it was impossible to go. <coughs> there are suggestions that the Soviets didn't go because coming second wouldn't look good, but they didn't stop the Americans earlier in the space race when they were coming second. There are those who suggest that if NASA faked the moon landings, the Soviets would have known. However, if this was so, the Americans probably bought Soviet uh, cooperation by driving wheat sodas. <laughs> In any case, this requires us to accept that the Cold War was a serious people claim it was, which is something that some of the hopes believe is a challenge as well. Anyway, all of the equipment which was supposed to be placed on the moon uh, during the uh, Apollo missions could have been placed by unmanned spacecraft. Uh, an unmanned spacecraft could have brought back samples just as the Soviets did. So there was nothing achieved by Apollo which actually required humans. Finally, why is it taking the USA so long to go back to the moon this time? If it only took eight years to do it in the 1960s with much more primitive technology. Now we move on to the second part of the talk. As I mentioned earlier, the point of this talk is to provide a few ideas on how to test whether a conspiracy theory is likely to be true when you don't have technical knowledge relevant to the subject being discussed. I'll summarise these ideas into 10 points, which I'll go through one by one, illustrating them with examples from the host believer arguments I've just mentioned. How should you use these questions? Well, I give no guarantee that they'll produce perfect results, but they should be sufficient to point you in the right direction. For example, if no argument holds up under your questions, uh, it's likely that the conspiracy theory is, to use a technical term, a complete crop. Um, on the other hand, if all the arguments hold up, um, then it's likely that the conspiracy is true. The third possibility is that some of the arguments work while others don't. In this case, perhaps there is a conspiracy, but it's, not just, it's just not the conspiracy theory that's being presented to you. But regardless of the answers, you should now be in a better position to research the conspiracy theory in more detail. So without further chatter, let's look at the, the, the tests to make of the conspiracy theory. Test one, is the argument factually correct? It's remarkable how many conspiracy theories are based on arguments which are simply factually incorrect. If you're presented with a conspiracy theory argument, the first thing to do is to check the surrounding facts. Many incorrect arguments are repeated in ignorance. But it's also been my unhappy experience that there are some purveyors of conspiracy theories who knowingly repeat arguments that they know are incorrect. 